Welcome to this online lesson on London in the Second World War. Preparing for the worst. Air raid precautions. The aims today are to identify organisations related to air raid precautions, to explain the role of ARP organisations and to evaluate the effectiveness of ARP organisations. First of all, have a look at this ARP poster. Keep cool, don't run, don't scream, prevent disorder and obey all instructions. This poster was pr produced in 1939. In your view, would this poster help or hinder those preparing for air raids? If you want to have a go at that starter question now, pause the video. Right, well, right, what did we think? Perhaps in some quite obvious ways it's a help. That's all sensible advice for people. However, do consider as well, would it be useful to uh, hi highlight all of these potential uh, undesired behaviours by people as well? Perhaps it highlights the scariness of the air raids. Mind you, whatever the case, air raids were going to happen on London and it was going to be terrifying and people would soon know the, know the truth. There wasn't much point in lying to people any, uh, about it anymore. Well, let's have a look at what ARP organisations there were. Here we see some photographs that give us some hints as to what some of the ARP organisations were all about. The Fire Brigade and the Women's Voluntary Service, which later became the Women's Royal Voluntary Service. First of all, though, we need to consider what some of these dangers were that they were facing. You'll see a selection of the main dangers associated with air raids in World War II. Your task will be to arrange the dangers in order of danger to life, to explain your choice for most and least dangerous. And then consider, are there any other potential dangers that you can think of? Here are the main dangers. I'll explain some in a bit more detail. Blast. The explosive force of the bomb could injure people and rupture lungs and eardrums. The blast could destroy buildings and cause collapses. Fire. Incendiary bombs were tiny but dropped in their thousands. An incendiary bomb is a bomb that starts a fire. Once fires took hold, people could die or, uh, from being burnt or die from the smoke. Bomb shrapnel. Bombs made from a heavy cast steel and iron case. When they exploded, they, the casing shattered, spraying deadly shrapnel through the air. Panic. The danger this might cause could be as simple as delaying the taking of cover, or at worst, could injure or kill in rushes for the shelters. As we'll see in a future lesson, this happened at least once. Fear. Living in fear could affect how people interacted with each other and how productive they were at work. They might also want to give in, in extreme circumstances. Collapsing buildings. Aside from being crushed, people could also be trapped in shelters and cellars, sometimes with limited air. Unexploded bombs. Not all bombs were designed to explode on impact. Some had delayed fuses that were set to go off hours or even days after the bomb hit. Others were simply faulty. All were dangerous. AA shrapnel. This stands for anti-aircraft shrapnel. The enemy wasn't the only danger. Like bomb shrapnel, shrapnel from exploding anti-aircraft fire could rain from the skies on anyone unlucky enough to be below. Although it should be said that anti-aircraft shrapnel was smaller and hit with a le lot less force than bomb shrapnel. Nevertheless, a heavy piece of metal falling on your head from any height is likely to be fat fatal. Lastly, crashing bombers. Not all of the bombers got to their target, or indeed got home. Anti-aircraft guns, searchlights, barrage balloons and night fighters all conspired to bring them crashing down. A barrage balloon, by the way, is a large hydrogen-filled balloon that is tethered to fly at a few thousand feet. This is unlikely to bring down bombers, but it certainly prevents them from flying at too low an altitude and being more accurate. That was the idea anyway. So, pause the video here, read the dangers, and complete the tasks on the left. Pause now. You'll now see some information about the agencies and organisations that were created or used to assist in the, the event of an air raid. Complete these tasks for each of the agencies. Task number one. Match the organisation to the dangers you recorded earlier and suggest how they might help. Here's the first organisation. Air Raid Precautions, otherwise known as ARP. Set up by an Act of Parliament in 1938, the ARP wardens, and there's an example of one pictured, and I'll come back to just who that is in a moment, were in charge of making sure their local area was prepared for an air attack. This included informing people of where public shelters were and how they might obtain their own shelter. Making sure the blackout was adhered to. Uh, this was the process of making sure that people didn't have visible lights that might give away their position. Sometimes, fire watching. This meant keeping a lookout for where incendiary or firebombs landed so that they could be put out. 
and also placing cordons around UXBs or unexploded bombs. They had an important role and were sometimes paid, but other times they were volunteers. This meant that they could be seen as a nuisance as they zealously checked the blackout, telling people to put that light out. The stereotypical ARP warden is portrayed in the TV comedy Dad's Army, and that's what I've pictured here. That's the ARP warden Hodges, who's one of the antagonists of the show. But that's basically the creators of that show remembering their wartime experiences and how annoying the ARP wardens could be. Nevertheless, they were actually very vital in people's preparedness for air raids. Pause the video now and complete task one. Okay. Well, in terms of the dangers, some of the things that the air raid precautions uh, people were very good um, at dealing with were not only the obvious ones like unexploded bombs and fire watching, but also reassuring people and trying to lower that sense of panic and fear that people had. Let's have a look at the next organisation. The London City Fire Service, or the Auxiliary Fire Service, which came later on. In peacetime, London City Council already provided a fire brigade. This was rapidly and significantly expanded by the auxiliaries of the AFS. Aside from their obvious role of putting out fires, the fire services also helped with the rescue of the trapped. They worked in the open while raids were still in progress, so their job was a hazardous one. Take a moment to complete task one again. OK, maybe some of the more obvious ones here, but remember these people dealt with the effects of blast, of course, they dealt with the effects of fire, and they can dealt with the effects of collapsed buildings too. Let's move on to the next organisation. Well, there's several in one here, so make sure that you do them all. The Heavy Rescue Service, pictured. The Ambulance Service, and Bomb Disposal. The Heavy Rescue Service were equipped with cranes and other equipment to clear rubble and free trap survivors from collapsed buildings. Once free, they tended to be needed to be taken away to hospitals, sometimes miles away. This was where the ambulance service could provide first aid and transport to more advanced life-saving care. As with the AFS, the ambulance service was supported by the auxiliaries. In addition, army bomb disposal units had the dangerous duty of making unexploded bombs safe, or transporting them away. Consider now how these agencies helped. Complete task one again. OK, hopefully we've uh, seen that the Heavy Rescue Service, they will deal with the effects of blast and collapsed buildings. The ambulances could uh, deal with any of the incidents that might cause injury, including things like panic and fear, but in particular the various types of bomb shrapnel, uh, smoking inhal inhalation, burns, crush damage, and any way that someone might be wounded by one of these uh, air raids. How about the Army Bomb Disposal Units? Well, they were very, they were very specifically focused on the unexploded bombs. There was sort of an arms race between the German bomb and fuse designers and the army bomb disposal units to try and keep up with how these worked. So it was incredibly dangerous work. Uh, they typically worked with a telephone line describing exactly what they were doing and exactly what they were seeing. So every time they did an, a different operation, they would explain what they were about to do. So that if the bomb went off, there would be a record of what the, the fuse looked like, what its markings were and exactly how not to set it off. Unfortunately, this would be too late for that particular bomb disposal worker. Brave people indeed. Let's have a look at another example. The Women's Royal Voluntary Service. Air raids left people grieving and terrified. Although families would often support each other, local organisations like churches and schools would help too. A more formal, organised service was the WRVS. They would provide basic comfort and care to the recently bombed and other victims of air attack. Their practical support with shelter, clothing and even well-timed cups of tea were very valued. How very British. Now you're going to complete task one again, but then you're going to complete tasks two and three for uh, bearing in mind the information you've got from all of the organisations. As a challenge, given all these uh, organisations already existed in 1940, how well prepared for the Blitz do you think London was? Explain your opinion. And as an extension, where did there appear to be gaps in London's preparedness, if any? Pause the video now and complete the tasks. Well, first of all, the Women's Royal Voluntary Service 
It was excellent for dealing with the uh, immediate effects of things like panic and fear. A very reassuring presence at this time. Also, in terms of collapsed buildings where people have been made homeless, they could help rehouse people or sort them out with temporary accommodation. Now, given that all of these uh, uh, organisations existed before the Blitz even began, it shows that London was actually quite well prepared for the Blitz. Nobody really knew what the effects were going to be, but many measures had been put in place so that there would have to be minimal adjustments once the raid started. But where do there appear to be gaps in London's preparedness? Well, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is the anti-aircraft defences themselves. Obviously, they're attached to the army and also parts of them are attached to the Royal Air Force. So they don't actually take part in the true air raid precautions. But another thing that we haven't mentioned is how were shelters actually provided? Well, that's not a, a necessarily a gap in the defences, but it is something that we're going to focus on in a future lesson. Perhaps you identified other things. Perhaps you could leave them in the comments below. Let's consider some of the sources that are of use to historians. The following are all primary sources, in other words created at the time of the event or from first-hand accounts, that historians use to learn about the effects of the bombing of London. Memories. These can be written soon after the event or many years later. That doesn't mean everything would be remembered, or indeed that everything would be wrong. Diaries. Usually written near the time of the event, but only to show one person's thoughts. Also consider that diaries are supposed to be private, so would they write them uh, expecting someone to read them? Official records. These include government and war cabinet records. The, the, the notes taken in meetings, for example. They record the decisions that the government took. Newspapers and radio reports. Reports from soon after the event, but affected by government censorship. Certain things were not allowed to be reported on. Damage done by bombs. Well, it seems obvious, but a smoking crater where a building once stood is a good evidence for a bomb falling. The bombs were surveyed by the London City Council bomb damage maps. I've mentioned before the website Bombsite, and I've included it in the description of this video. A link to that website shows an interactive map of London that shows where all of the high explosive plotted bombs fell. Your tasks then. Note down each source type as a subheading. Then, describe the source. Consider real, what might make the source useful to historians. I'll come back to that in a moment. And what might make each source of limited usefulness. You might want to include this all as one paragraph. You don't have to divide it up between A, B and C. Just make sure that you include all of that. As an extension, what other sources might a historian draw upon? Repeat task one for a source of your choice. This is what I mean by real. You've got to ask yourself, is the information that's in this uh, type of source likely to be relevant? Is it going to be about the Blitz? Is it likely to be enough? So in other words, is it going to have sufficient detail to be useful? What about the author? Is the author likely to be biased, censored or aware of the facts? And then limitations. What might make the source unreliable other than what you've already written? OK, pause the video now and attempt those tasks. Did you think of any other sources that might be useful to a historian? Well, what about movies made at the time? Yes, there were films made about the Blitz during the Blitz. Also, the equivalent of TV news back then were newsreels. These tend to be shown in cinemas before the main feature. British Pathé is a good example of an organisation that did this. Now, the limitations of those sorts of sources is they were typically controlled by or even produced by the government, and so they put forward an idea of propaganda, which can be useful in its own way for looking at what the government want, uh, wanted people to believe, but can be really limited in terms of understanding what the true effects of the Blitz were. We're going to move on to one final thing to consider now. Have a look at this picture. It's one of the most famous pictures taken of the Blitz, and it was taken from a German bomber overlooking the London Docklands areas. Those ridge-shaped buildings, those are all warehouses in the London dockyards. On the right, those dark rectangles are actually part of the Docklands, and you can see ships moored up there getting unloaded. And you can see the River Thames sweeping through. I'll now gradually superimpose a modern picture of London over the top of it, so you can get your bearings as to what you're looking at. These days, of course, Canary Wharf is very much the London financial district, and no longer operates as a port in the way that it did. Notice that much of the area where there were once warehouses is now green open space. The road layouts have changed slightly too. 
Much of this is, in fact, evidence of the bombing itself and areas of London that were rebuilt after the Blitz. A matter of perspective. Okay, I admit, this source always reminds me of the start of EastEnders. This is a photograph of a Heinkel HE-111 bomber over London. This was taken by the Luftwaffe on the first day of the Blitz, which was the 7th of September 1940. Consider the purpose of this photograph. 1. In what ways might the purpose of this photograph be German propaganda? 2. In what ways might the purpose of this photograph be to assess the damage of the raid? And 3. Which of these purposes seems most likely? Explain your opinion. Pause the video while you work that out. Then press play when you're ready to continue. Well, how might it be German propaganda? Well, for one thing, that's a pretty obvious picture of London. The Thames sneaking, th uh, sneaking through is a very recognisable feature of the city. How do we know it's a German bomber? Well, you don't have to be an expert in aircraft recognition to know that that's a Heinkel 111. In fact, you don't even need to know what type of plane it is at all. Just look at the crosses on the wing. That is a typically German-marked aircraft, and it shows, or rather proves, that the Germans were flying over London. That's significant propaganda for the Nazis, as the bomber looks unopposed as well, and it shows London looking vulnerable beneath the wings of that German bomber. How might this be about assessing the bomb damage? Well, detailed aerial photographs like this could be taken in surprisingly high resolution and used by interpreters to look for specific bomb damage and to work out what damage was being done, what targets have been missed, and what might need to be targeted in the future. However, with this photograph, I would argue that there is not a lot of damage to be seen. It is well known that the first uh, raids of the Blitz produced very heavy fires in the east end of London, and I can't see a lot of evidence of these fires in this photograph. I can possibly see in the centre one collapsed warehouse, but that could have happened before. Another reason why this might not be too much about the assessment of bomb, bomb damage is, well, quite frankly, that German bomber is right in the way of where some of the damage might be. So which purpose seems most likely? I would argue probably the propaganda purpose. This is showing deliberately a German bomber over a vulnerable looking London. It's a striking image and one that is very famous to this day. And on that note, we'll finish. Thanks for watching the video. I hope that that's been useful to you. And if it has, please like the video and consider subscribing to this channel where there's more content like this all the time. Thanks very much and goodbye.